welcome to Virtual Church, New Hope Christian Fellowship. It's good to be together once again, virtually, and uh, hopefully live. We are planning on having live church today at 10 o'clock in the, in the church building. And hope if, if you can't join us virtually, or obviously you're joining us virtually, but if you want to join us live, you can do that at 10 o'clock. So we're going to sing today. We're going to lift up the Lord and then open his word and glean some insight for us to have some wisdom for living today. And so we're going to, I wanted to just establish some firmness and all of the disarray that's going on in our world. I thought it would be good just to proclaim the firmness of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sing with me, would you? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus. That again, my hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus.
Lord of our lives. No matter what goes on, He is Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now can stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now can stand. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely. says in the scriptures and when we built our house upon the rock Lord the 
the strength that we receive cannot be counted. It cannot be measured. It is so immense. I pray that those who feel weak today, those, those who are in disarray, maybe in their lives, that you will ground them in you, ground them in your word, ground them in your love, ground them so firmly that as the storms may rage around them, there will be certain peace in their lives. So I speak peace in their lives. I'm sure there's many, Lord, within the sound of my voice that need your touch specifically in a particular area in their life. I pray that you, as, as they articulate that need to you, that you will meet that need and be all sufficient as we put all of our trust and all of our hope in you and you pour out your love for us. As I heard it said this last week, you can do no less. You can do no less than to keep pouring your love into us. And so Jesus, we thank you that you will do this because you are great. In your wonderful name, amen. Today is the Sunday before Veterans Day, and I just love Veterans Day. I love honoring the people who have served in our armed forces. One of the special moments for me is when we're live in church. I love having veterans stand, and each one shares where they served, and what, what branch they served in, and each one shares what their rank was. And just to see in a moment a glimpse of their background and all that they went through, and the sacrifice that they made so that we can have freedom here today. And to all of you who are veterans, I just send a heartfelt thank you to you for the price that you paid. And certainly we think of those who paid the ultimate price. I know we honor them on Memorial Day, but it behooves us to say, uh, how much we appreciate their sacrifice as well. America can be free today because of the sacrifices, the ultimate sacrifice that, that has been paid by many, and of course the sacrifice that has been paid for everyone who has gone through our armed services. And I thought it would be a, a special moment today that we would pray for America and indeed sing our prayer for America. We keep praying for America as often as we possibly can. And so, would you join with me and let's pray for America. And we're going to sing the song, God Bless America. What a great prayer. And so I want you to sing it out with me. Don't, don't be bashful. If you, if you have to stand up, stand up and just belt it out. Uh, you may not sound like Pav Pavarotti, but you can still sing. And so don't let anybody laugh at you. That's okay. You just stand and you sing or you sit and you sing. And let's pray for America today. Here we go. God bless America. church, you can do that 10 o'clock on Sunday, which is today. You, you can join us at 10 o'clock and just something, everybody being together. And remember, we're practicing social distancing. We're practicing the protocols that, that are necessary. So mask and social distancing are important. I want to thank you for your giving 
Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that during this season, you have remained faithful. And all of you that have just uh, sacrificed and given, I just want to say thank you. And uh, I want to pray for the offering, and I want to pray for you. Lord, I just come before you with a grateful heart during this Thanksgiving season just to say thank you for your blessing. Thank you for the material wealth. I pray, Lord, that you would bless and that you would utilize it to fulfill the mission, to complete the goals. I pray, Lord, that it would touch people's hearts and let the kingdom be expanded. I pray for those who do give. I pray that you'll draw near to them and meet every need in their heart. You would be Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. And Jesus, in, in all of this, let there be certain peace in them. You are our God, and we trust in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing I wanted to say. Are you going to be alone this Thanksgiving? Are you going to be in your house, and, and you're not going to be anywhere? That concerns me. And if you are, would you please drop me an email? You can send it to uh, goforitkurt at gmail.com. That's goforitkurt at gmail.com. Send me an email because I'm working on something that I think will bless you. Well, today, uh, after all that's been transpiring in terms of our country, in terms of what's been happening with uh, elections, in terms of what's been happening with uh, the, the stuff that has distracted us, quite honestly, it's, we've been focusing on whether we have tested positive or whether we tested negative. And we have seen all sorts of violence sweep through our land that has been a huge issue for all of us. And, and certainly we've come through this season of fires. There's still a few fires burning, but this season, wow, what, what a huge issue that has caused us to uh, uh, interrupt our lives in essence. And certainly many lives have been interrupted because of the loss of their possessions, in some cases, total loss of their possessions. And, and then we've had to make even, even adjustments in sports, you know, basketball and baseball and, and, and football. It's not the same because of the different adjustments that we have had made in so many issues and so many things that have happened. The normal things of our life have kind of been diverted to focus our attention on those different things. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to ask this question, now what? You know, we've come to this moment, here we are in the middle of November, and we've come to this moment, now what? And I want to bring us back to the original goal, to the original call that is on us as Christians, on us as people of God. And I wanted to share with you that God has called us to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. I want to refocus our energies. I want us to focus on this ultimate goal that God has for us, even in this environment of uncertainty. It, uh, we may do things differently. We may do things not the way that we're used to. We may have new methods and new opportunities, but we have the same goal. I'm just reminded of a prophecy that was spoken over Debbie some years ago. And the prophecy said something like this, that God was going to use her left hand and not her right hand, which means God is going to do something in the abnormal way. And, the, and she will have to adapt to that left-handed method. I think that very thing is happening today in the church world, in the, in the faith world. We are having to adapt to different things and different ways of doing things. Not to change our goal, but to change how we do our goal. I want to return us to our primary objective. And where does our primary objective come from? Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where it says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Here we see Jesus himself giving to us, just before he left this earth and ascended into heaven, our primary objective, what the purpose of our life is, and that is to go and make disciples of all nations. Go and preach 
the gospel. Now, you might say, I'm not a preacher. You know what? God is going to use you to share the gospel in many different ways and many different forms. I was reading this last week at Martin Luther. I've been reading his sermons here these past few months, and I've enjoyed what he has written. But he asked this particular question in one of his sermons. He said, he asked, what is the gospel? And then he defines it. He says, it is these words which the Lord speaks. He, hath be he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That is the gospel. And the gospel is that Jesus loves them. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is that we can be free from our sin, we can be free from the ultimate destiny of sin, and we can look forward to the ultimate destiny of being with the Lord Jesus Christ all through all eternity. Do I hear an amen on that? Yeah, through all eternity. That is the gospel. Some people have thought that they exchange the gospel for helping the poor and, and feeding the hungry. Now, those are important things. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is much more lasting than a bowl of soup. The gospel is much more lasting than a roof over your head. The gospel is eternal. And that is for all eternity, you can be free from the, from the ultimate destiny of sin, which is death. I want you to note here in the Great Commission that the gospel is not about any particular organization. That the gospel is not about being political. The gospel is not about some financial issue. The gospel is not about some material wealth. You see, God, let me put it this way, God is willing to throw all of those things to the wind if it means that you can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and know Him and have a relationship with Him. In fact, we see a track record of that all through Scripture, how God destroyed this and God destroyed that because those things became the focus more than God. And God is still the same today. He will destroy those things that take our focus because God wants people to know that He loves them and He wants to save people to have relationship with Him. Martin Luther goes on to talk about the gospel, and he says this, It, speaking of the gospel, shall be preached so publicly that to preach it more publicly would be impossible. Boy, I had to stop and listen, look at that sentence again. Now, what a powerful statement. It needs to preach, be preached so publicly, so much so that it, to preach it more publicly would be impossible. And so we have the call of God to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I want to skip over to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, because here we see an outline for us that we can follow in order to live in these end times. What are we supposed to do in these end times? How are we to fulfill that mission and that mandate to spread the gospel? Peter gives to us a wonderful outline. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's stewards of God's varied grace. Love that phrase, varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the dominion forever and forever. Amen. What a great outline. And so I want to take a look at that outline with you and the different things he says that we need to practice in our life to and that enable us to go out and spread the gospel. The first thing he says here is that we need to be self-controlled. Does anybody need more self-control? Certainly I do. If you look up self-control in the dictionary, it simply means restraint, exercise over one's own impulses, emotions, or desires. I love that phrase, restraint, exercise. 
Self-control is simply the strength, the ability to control those things, my impulses, which means, in, in a very basic picture, as you go through the checkout line at the store, and they have the, the, all those things, gum and candy and maybe magazines and other little trinkets there, they call, call that impulse buying. In order to go through that channel, you have to protect, you have to exercise self-control so you don't get caught up in impulse buying. Some of us do it on a larger scale as we're walking through the entire store. We, we lose our self-control and buy this and that and this and that. But here he's telling us that we need to exercise self-control and don't lose it. Now if there's ever a time that we need to exercise self-control in our life, it's now. Because fl uh, uh, the, the flaring up of attitudes and anger and people spouting off this and that. We, as a people of God, need to be so bathed in the Holy Spirit that we can look past what they're saying and look at their heart in order to love their heart. And it takes self-control to do that because we can be blindsided, can't we? We can be like a magician who diverts our attention over here while the magician is working over here. What we need to do is we need to maintain discipline so that we can stay focused on what is truly important. What is important? God is important. The gospel going out is important. And all of everything else comes under submission to that. I, I just want, don't allow yourself to be sucker punched. Sucker punches, you're distracted and then you're hit. You know what? Stay focused and do and maintain self-control. The second thing he says is be sober-minded, which means to be clear-headed, you know, so that you could think properly in all things. One of the phrases I try to live by as much as I as much as I can, is this little th statement that says, there's more going on than what I see. There's more going on than what I see. Lord, help me see what's really happening. Let me think clearly. Don't, don't allow me to get muddied up in my biases or even my opinions. But Lord, help me see what you see. Let me hear what you hear so that I could think soberly. Soberly doesn't mean somber. Soberly simply means clear-minded and with reality. Be sober-minded. Be clear-headed. And then he says, for the sake of prayer. Why is that? Well, James tells us that when he asks, speaking of those of us who are praying, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. We need to pray with a clear mind and a clear heart and sober thinking so that we can pray realistically and pray with the heart and the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ so that things can happen and so that things will happen rather than getting caught up in vain things. I liken it to the main, many postings I see on Facebook. You know, there's... I know some of you have gotten rid of Facebook, and frankly, I don't blame you. But one of the things that bothers me is people posting fake news, or people posting things that are supposedly true, but they're not. And a simple search online can ascertain whether that is true or not. But what happens is people just blindly pass on information without thinking about it. You know what happens? We get caught up in all that stuff, and it dilutes our thinking. It causes there to be a cloud in our minds, and we believe untruths. Don't get caught up, not just in the vain posties on Facebook, but don't get caught up in that type of thing in real life. So he says that we need to be self-controlled. He says we need to be sober-minded. Thirdly, he says that we need to love one another. Love one another. How often we talk about that, love one another. Now the word love is of course the word agape and most people always interpret that as unconditional love, that's true. But I read a different definition one time that really nailed it down for me and that is when I agape love somebody, I think of what's in their best interest, not my own. What makes them great, not me. 
In other words, my love focus is changed. It changed from defending myself to trying to bless them and love them in the way that they should benefit. What benefits them? Agape love is indeed all about them. That's what God did for us. He looked at us, he saw our need, and he says, what can I do that would benefit them? And so that's how God loved us, dying on the cross for our sin. And of course, rising from the dead, that gives us incredible hope. We need to love one another. And then Peter says here, we need to love one another because love covers wounds. Love covers wounds. We need to really understand here, there's a lot of hurt and pain in our society. I was talking with somebody just recently and we were talking about how everybody is experiencing some kind of pain. And you know what love does? Love in essence comes and puts a band-aid on that pain. Or love covers that pain. Let me put it in a more human sense. Love hugs the wounded heart in order to bring a salve to the, to the hurting heart. And we as Christians, in, a, in this day, in this time, need to be people who love people. Not get caught up on our own biases and, the, and get caught up in our own stuff and defending. God wants us to love people. And in loving people, it's all about them. And here's what we do. We say, but they do this and they do that. That's not what, that's not what loving people do. Loving people is all about them. Yes, we may be frustrated, but loving people is all about them. And many wounds require much love. In our world, we need to love people. You know, and part of our call towards one another as Christians is that we would call, there's that term that says, be my six, which means the six o'clock is the back position, right? Be my, we cover each other's backside. We protect each other's backside. That's what love does. Love one another. In this day, as we are seeing the increasing amount of attacks towards the people of faith, as people are martyrs, people that are being antagonized, we need, indeed, to love one another. We need to think of their benefit, we need to think of protecting them, and we need to let them know that, that we are here to cover their pain. That's what the love that he's talking about here. Next in our outline, he tells us that we need to be hospitable. When you look at hospi hospitality, you, you look it up in the dictionary, it just basically means generous and, and friendly. And I like this part that Peter adds in here without grumbling. We need to be people who are hospitable. We need to look at people that are God-given. God has given them to us so that we can, be, we can pour ourselves into their lives and be hospitable to them, meeting their needs, be generous and, and friendly and caring. We need to be hospitable. In these days, man, in the darkness of these days, we need to be a light of generosity and a light to their hands. Hospitable means simply as well, open your hand, open your heart, and open your life. Open your hand, open your heart, and open your life to people. In these days, we need to be hospitable. I know it's, it's even more difficult now because of the COVID, and it seems like we're all stuck in our homes. We need to figure out ways that we can keep being hospitable to people. Next, Peter tells us that we need to exercise our gifts. Do you realize that God has given us, each and every one of us, gifts? And our gifts are given to us for the edification of the body. In other words, that the body of Christ can be bolstered up. If we look at Ephesians, it tells us that he is, it is he who has given some apostles and prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service, notice this, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We each, each of us are given gifts that the body of Christ may be strong. God has given you, you, a particular uh, gift, a, a particular motivational gift, a, a particular calling so that the body of Christ can prosper. 
You know what's frustrating as a pastor? Is people who have gifts, but they let them lie dormant. And you know what happens? The body suffers because that person is not living out their gifts. And you know what happens most often? Because that person is not living out their gift, we have another person over here that's trying to accomplish the call of two or three people that are not doing their job. Is that just being frank and honest with you? Let me tell you something. God has called each of us to live out our gift. And in the ultimate call of spreading the gospel, if each of us fulfills the gift that we have, how strong will we be? And if we are strong as a body of Christ, we will be able to endure going through the trials and the tribulations of this world. And so Peter is telling us, exercise these gifts and serve one another, help one another, he says, and be stewards. And a steward, remember, a steward is somebody who just takes care of the possessions of somebody else. With the things that we have, our homes, our, our, our valuables, and the things that we're in charge of, you know what? We're simply stewards of that stuff because it all belongs to God. And God wants us to use it for his glory. We need to be stewards of what God has given to us because it belongs to Him anyway. And then we need to speak. And I like this part here that talks about being speaking the oracles of God. Uh, I just want to emphasize an oracle is simply a word proclaimed. And a word proclaimed, and he qualifies this, is God's word proclaimed. Not my word proclaimed. God's word proclaimed. Right now in our world, we hear a lot of politics of people saying this, saying that, saying that. What we as Christians need to be hearing is God's word and proclaiming his word. And his word is a ring of word, the word of God come to life so that we can go forth in his power. We need to speak the oracles of God. Peter next tells us that we need to serve and that word serve simply means diakono, which is the Greek word where we get our word deacon. If you look it up in the Greek, it simply means to serve, to render assistance, to take care of, to wait upon, to serve food and drink, to be a deacon, to, to minister to people. We need to serve. And we serve not by our own authority and by our own strength. We serve by His strength, serving Him. God has called us to be people who serve. That means as we go down the street, we open our eyes. How can we serve? As we're going down the street, helping, walking, we could help people and serve. God wants us to have a heart of a servant, serving our world. How our lives change. Not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are caught up in their own world and, and trying to parse out every law. You know what? They, they, were, they were ineffective to the, to the world because they were caught up with their haughtiness and their religiosity. But God comes and he tells us to live differently. He tells us to serve one another, to love, and, to, and all, all these other things. And then lastly, Peter tells us that we need to give God the glory. Everything that we do is for him. There are those who want to parse out their lives. You know, this is my public life, this is my private life, this is my work life, this is my entertainment life. This is my, my inner life. This is my outer life. You know what? It's all, when, you're, when you become a Christian, it's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. And so He tells us in this brief outline that we need to be self-controlled. We need to be sober-minded. We need to love one another. We need to be people of hospitality. We need to exercise the gifts that God has given to us. We need to serve and then we need to give God the glory. In all of that, we will be able to spread the gospel effectively. One of the great verses says that they will know we are Christians by our love. A love, by the way, that is acted out, not just thought of in our mind. A love that is engaged. And now what, when we're talking about what we are supposed to do now, I want to restore the main focus of our existence is to spread the gospel and to spread the gospel by giving the, out the love that the Lord has given to us. And so in 2 Peter in chapter 3, it kind of gives us this wonderful warning. He says, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. 
With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. And here I'm highlighting it for you. He is patient with you. Why? Because he's not want, he does not want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. You might be saying, why is God, why is the Lord taking so long to come? Because he loves people and he wants people to come to know him. He's given everybody an opportunity to know him and have a relationship with him. And he wants all of us who are people of faith to have that same urgency in our life. That God is doing all of this in order to save people. We should be doing it as well. That we would see people come to know Christ. So what is our goal? Our goal is not politics. Our goal is not even material. Our goal is not even pleasure. Our goal is the gospel. Does that mean we can't participate in those other things? No, that doesn't mean that at all. It simply means that everything that we do is going to have a thread of being able to be a witness to the gospel and to the love of Jesus Christ. So our goal is to share the gospel. Our goal is to be the gospel. And our goal is to live the gospel. Go and make disciples. And listen, if we as a people, and if we as an individual, because we as a people are just a bunch of individuals, if each one of us would dedicate ourselves to this kind of living, listen, I can't imagine the strength and the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit that would move through us. Psalm 133 1 says that there is anointing to when people are together in unity. And that unity is not just talking about, oh, they're all together enjoying sandwiches. <laughs> it's talking about their, their heart, their mind, their will, their emotions, their sacrifice is for the body and the Lord of Jesus Christ. I think that's what we need to do today. If we are going to have an impact for the gospel of Christ. With that in mind, I want to sing a prayer. It's an altar. I want to make this an altar today. Wherever you are, this is an altar. And I'm going to ask you today, I'm going to ask you right now to surrender your entire life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be saying, well, I'm saved. I'm, you may be saved. But you know what? You've been maybe had a little barrier, maybe held things back. God wants your all. He wants all of us, every part of us. And we've withheld this, we've withheld that. But God is saying, will you give your all? And so I want to sing a prayer with you. Now, sometimes, and I know I read the statistics, I think a lot of you check out right about now. Don't do that. I want you to stay through. And let's, let's uh, seal this word into our own hearts and in our, into our own lives. Make this an altar. Don't just rush from this moment and go this, and go here and do there. This is God's appointment. And God wants you, and he wants you to have a relationship with him that is deeper and more rich than you ever thought possible. But for whatever reason, you've been distracted here, you focus your attention over there. No, come back here. Come back here with me. And let's say, all right, Lord, it's all about you. I surrender to you. And so the words of this song are really the prayer that I want to pray. And I want you to pray with me. Let's sing it together. Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. as you draw me near desperate for you desperate for you here it is I surrender drench my soul say that drench my soul as mercy and grace Unfold, I hunger and thirst. I hunger and thirst. With arms stretched wide, I know you hear my cry. Speak to me now. Speak to me now. 
myself in the full complete authority and the purposes and the means and the methods of God that you would use me as you would I sacrifice my own that and take on you because you are my God and knowing this we will not just survive during these times but we will prosper during these times and we will prosper in the grace and the favor and the love and the joy and the peace of God and you Lord shall surround us with your goodness and we will experience you and because of that we'll be able to be witnesses ambassadors of, of, for Christ going out into our world and making disciples Lord do that we pray and as a result we pray that our land will be blessed in Jesus name Amen. Go and make disciples. You may not be able to preach on a street corner. You may not be able to stand and, and hold your Bible and, and declare the deep theologies, but God can use you in whatever way. It may be cooking meals for somebody. It, it may be simply hugging somebody in their sickness. It, whatever way, God's going to use you to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep that as the mainstay, as the main focus of your existence. It's all about Him. With that said, I want to bless you today. I want to bless you with this blessing that I prayed over you last week. And I just believe in praying the blessing. As we see in the Old Testament, the priest would, would bless the people. Well, that's what I want to do today. I want to bless you. I want to bless you with this word that comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Where it says this and may the lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows and may he as a result make your hearts strong blameless and holy as you stand before god our father when our lord jesus comes again with all his holy people amen go and have a great week this week